Ever noticed how every flight seems to level off around the same number? 37,000 feet, not 30,000, not 40,000. Always right there, in that oddly specific slice of sky. It's one of aviation's quiet mysteries, a number so routine that most passengers never think twice about it. But behind it lies decades of trial, error, and hard science. Up here, the air is thin enough to save fuel, smooth enough to keep your coffee steady, and dense enough to keep the engines breathing. By the end of this video, you'll know why 37,000 feet is aviation's sweet spot and what would happen if we flew any higher or lower. When a pilot takes off, their goal isn't just to reach the destination, it's to reach the altitude where the airplane burns the least fuel for the most distance. That's the science of cruise altitude. Air at sea level is dense, full of oxygen, moisture, and resistance. A plane flying low has to constantly fight that density, pushing against molecules that slow it down. The higher the altitude, the thinner the air becomes, and that means less drag on the wings and fuselage. Less drag equals less thrust required, and that means lower fuel consumption. At 37,000 feet, the air is roughly one quarter as dense as it is at sea level. That thinness allows a jet to slice through the sky with far less effort, but it's not just about drag. The engines themselves are designed to love the cold, thin air. Jet engines operate more efficiently when the air is cooler. The temperature at 37,000 feet averages around minus 55 Celsius. That chill makes combustion inside the engine more stable and powerful. Cooler air also means lower chances of overheating and better performance over long periods. But as efficient as that sounds, there is a limit. Go too high and the air becomes too thin. The engine can't compress enough oxygen for combustion. The wings don't get enough lift to keep the plane level without increasing angle of attack, which adds drag back into the equation. The higher you go, the more you risk entering a zone where a plane can no longer climb or descend safely, what pilots call coffin corner. That's why 37,000 feet sits in the Goldilocks zone. It's high enough for thin air and low drag, yet low enough for the engines and wings to still work perfectly. A typical long-haul jet like a Boeing 777 or Airbus A350 burns about 5 tons of fuel per hour. At 25,000 feet, the same plane could burn nearly 6, a difference that might not sound like much, but over thousands of hours each year, it adds up to millions in fuel savings. Pilots also use what's called step climbs. As the plane burns fuel and becomes lighter, it can gradually climb higher, maybe from 33,000 feet to 35,000 feet, and then up to 37,000 feet. Each step squeezes a little more efficiency out of the flight, and that's why you might occasionally feel a gentle climb even hours after takeoff. Every major airliner has a most economical altitude, and for the vast majority of them, that number ends up being right around 37,000 feet. It's the place where gravity, aerodynamics, and fuel efficiency all meet in balance. Now let's talk about comfort, because efficiency alone doesn't make for a pleasant flight. The atmosphere is divided into layers, and most of the weather we experience, clouds, storms, turbulence, lives in the lowest one, the troposphere. That's the layer stretching up to around 35 or 40,000 feet, depending on where you are on the planet. The Concorde once flew above it entirely, but for ordinary jets, the trick is to sit right near the top edge, just high enough to stay out of the mess, but not so high the performance drops. Below 30,000 feet, the air is alive with instability. Warm currents rise, cold currents fall, and thunderstorms punch upwards in columns of turbulence. By the time you reach 37,000 feet, you're above most of that chaos. Up here, the clouds are far below, and the sky takes on a deeper, darker blue. The air is thinner, more calmer, and more predictable. That means smoother rides, fewer bumps, and less strain on the aircraft's frame. It also means fewer weather delays. Another benefit hides in the upper atmosphere, the jet streams. These are fast-moving rivers of air, sometimes exceeding 150 miles per hour, that flow from west to east around the planet. By flying within or near these streams, pilots can shave hours off transcontinental routes. A flight from New York to London might take six and a half hours thanks to tailwind, while the return leg can take over seven and a half because of the headwind. Cruising near 37,000 feet positions jets perfectly to take advantage of these air currents. Too low and they'd miss them. Too high and the engines would strain. It's also the altitude where the most efficient routes intersect. Airlines work closely with air traffic control to coordinate corridors in this band of sky. The invisible highways where thousands of planes cross the planet daily. It's crowded up there, but it's orderly. Every flight has its lane, and 37,000 feet is where those lanes are most heavily traveled. So while it might feel like you're just coasting through empty space, you're actually flying through a carefully chosen slice of atmosphere, the calmest, most reliable, and most cost-effective part of the sky. So if high altitude makes flying smoother and cheaper, why not go even higher? What's stopping us from cruising in near space? If flying higher saved more fuel and offered smoother air, you might wonder, why stop there? Why not fly at 45,000 feet or even higher? The answer comes down to physics and engineering. Every plane has a service ceiling, usually around 41,000 feet for commercial jets. 
the point where lift, thrust, and air density stop cooperating. Beyond that, even minor changes in speed can bring a plane dangerously close to a stall. At those altitudes, the difference between a safe cruising speed and the stall speed might be only 20 or 30 knots. It's a razor-thin margin, one that leaves almost no room forever. That's the coffin corner we mentioned earlier. But what would actually happen if a jet pushed beyond that limit, just a few hundred feet too high? Pressurization also becomes more difficult. A typical jet keeps its cabin at the equivalent of around 8,000 feet. The higher you go, the bigger the pressure difference between the inside and outside of the aircraft. That puts more stress on the fuselage. For a long-haul flight, maintaining the pressure safely becomes expensive and structurally demanding. So while flying higher might sound better in theory, it becomes a losing game in practice. 37,000 feet offers just the right balance between efficiency, safety, and aircraft longevity. Well, of course, there are exceptions. The Concorde famously cruised around 60,000 feet, almost twice as high as the normal airliner. At that altitude, the air was so thin that shockwaves from its supersonic flight barely reached the ground. But achieving that required an entirely different kind of engine, the Rolls-Royce Snecma Olympus, and an airframe built to handle temperatures over 100 degrees C on the nose. It was magnificent, but it was also unstable for ordinary travel. On the opposite end of the spectrum, smaller regional jets and turboprops cruise lower, often between 25,000 and 30,000 feet, because their engines and wings are optimized for shorter hops, not long-distance fuel efficiency. Even within large jets, altitude varies. A Boeing 737 flying from Paris to Rome might sit at 34,000 feet, while a Boeing 787 crossing the Pacific could gradually climb from 33,000 up to 39,000 as its fuel load decreases. So when you hear that chime in the cabin and the captain announces a cruising altitude of 37,000 feet, it's not just routine. It's the calculated intersection of aerodynamics, safety, and economy. But the story of 37,000 feet isn't only written in aerodynamics or fuel charts, it's also shaped by the people inside the cabin and the invisible systems that keep them safe. There's another side to cruising altitude that has nothing to do with engines or drag. It's about us. The human body wasn't built to live at 37,000 feet. Up there, the outside pressure is barely a quarter of what it is at sea level. Without pressurization, you'd lose consciousness in seconds. That's why every jet keeps its cabin pressurized to the equivalent of about 8,000 feet above sea level. It's not perfect comfort, but it's the sweet spot where oxygen levels are still high enough for most passengers to feel, and the aircraft structure doesn't have to bear extreme pressure loads. Each time you hear the door seal shut before takeoff, the fuselage becomes a controlled environment, one that quietly fights the laws of physics for the next several hours. But even with that protection, the air inside is still thin and dry. Humidity often drops below 20%, which is why you feel dehydrated or tired after a long flight. The oxygen level in your blood slightly decreases, your body works harder, and some people feel mild headaches or drowsiness. The crew manages these conditions constantly, adjusting temperature, lighting, and airflow to keep passengers comfortable. And if the cabin ever lost pressure at 37,000 feet, those yellow oxygen masks you've seen in safety briefings become lifesavers. They deliver enough oxygen to keep you conscious during the rapid descent to a safer altitude, usually around 10,000 feet. It's a scenario pilots train for relentlessly, because at that height, you only have seconds to act before hypoxia sets in. So while you're sipping coffee and watching clouds drift by, there's a quiet balance being maintained, a mix of engineering and biology that makes life possible at an altitude where humans simply shouldn't be. Of course, 37,000 feet isn't just the number that works for one plane. It's part of a massive, coordinated ballet happening above our heads. At any given moment, more than 10,000 commercial flights are in the sky. To keep all those aircraft safely separated, air traffic control divides the atmosphere into altitude lanes. In most parts of the world, eastbound flights use odd-numbered flight levels, 33,000, 35,000, 37,000, while westbound flights stick to even ones, 34,000, 36,000, 38,000. This simple rule means that planes traveling in opposite directions never share the same altitude, and since most long-haul routes run east to west, 37,000 has become one of the most crowded, yet most efficient levels in commercial aviation. Modern jets also fly under something called RVSM, or Reduced Vertical Separation Minimum. It allows planes to cruise just 1,000 feet apart vertically instead of the old standard of 2,000. That's only possible because of the precision of modern avionics and autopilot systems, which can hold altitude within a few feet. Without RVSM, the airspace above 29,000 feet would be far more limited, and the highways of the sky would be jammed. Then there's route optimization, the art of matching each aircraft's altitude with weather data, jet stream patterns, and the weight of the plane. Airplanes plan these routes down to the minute. If a jet can catch a favorable tailwind at 37,000 feet, it could shave off 20 minutes and thousands of pounds of fuel on a single crossing. 
Multiply that by hundreds of flights a day, and it's easy to see why altitude planning has become one of aviation's quiet obsessions. To passengers, it might feel like endless sky, but in reality, that sky is a grid, carefully managed, constantly monitored, and filled with invisible traffic lanes stretching across continents and oceans. 37,000 feet isn't just the sweet spot for aerodynamics, it's where global coordination, technology, and trust all come together to keep the world moving. But even with all that precision and coordination, there are still plenty of myths about what really happens up there. There's a common saying among travelers, the higher you fly, the smoother the ride. It's partly true, but it's also oversimplified. Yes, higher altitudes tend to have calmer air, but every layer of the atmosphere has its own personality. Jet streams can cause turbulence even at cruising heights. Volcanic ash, high altitude thunderstorms, or sudden temperature gradients can still make a plane shake at 37,000 feet. Pilots avoid trouble not just by altitude, but by reading the weather ahead and adjusting course minute by minute. Another misconception is that all planes can comfortably reach 37,000 feet. In reality, that number depends heavily on the aircraft type, the route, and the weight. A fully loaded Airbus A380 at takeoff might struggle to reach that height until it's burned off several tons of fuel. Pilots climb in stages, moving higher as the plane gets lighter. And perhaps the biggest myth, that the sky has no limits, that somehow, the higher we fly, the closer we get to perfection. But aviation doesn't work like that. Every gain in altitude comes with a cost, more stress on the fuselage, thinner margins for error, greater strain on systems. At 37,000 feet, airliners have room to maneuver if they need to descend quickly or divert for an emergency. They're not too far away from breathable air and not so high that recovery becomes impossible. It's a practical ceiling, one shaped by physics and decades of hard-learned experience. You could say it's where ambition meets reality. So, why 37,000 feet? Because it's where everything comes together. The sweet spot where the air is thin enough to save fuel, smooth enough to stay comfortable, and dense enough to keep the engines breathing easily. Every time your plane levels off and the seatbelt sign flicks off, you're watching decades of aeronautical science at work. So next time you fly, glance out the window, the world below will look calm and endless, and you'll know why your pilot chose to cruise right there, at 37,000 feet. If you'd like to keep uncovering the hidden logic behind how we fly, hit like and subscribe because there are always more stories left from the skies.